when it was decided we go to Chicago and we started building the pile, it was a composite of wood, four by fours, and graphite. Graphite was awful. It was it's very dense, it's very slippery, and it's very dirty. We had shifts building this pile and Fermi would decide what the composition would be between the wood, which was primarily a cradle on the outside, and the graphite in the inside. We didn't have any uranium metal, but we had centered uranium or uranium powder, and these were formed into sort of like hockey pucks, which were inserted in the graphite. And he just dictated where these were to be placed and what the layers of graphite were to be built. And I don't know how many months we did this, but it wasn't until the end of November, getting toward December, when it was pretty clear something was going to happen. And then it was, I guess it was on December the 2nd. Uh, the night before, Fermi had told Herb to uh, lock up, close up, lock up, and he'd start the next morning. And he evidently knew how close we were to criticality. We started that morning, and George Weil was down in the uh, pit working what was called a control rod, which was a meter stick with a, I think it had a big slab of cadmium on top of it. Most of the people were gathered on the balcony. Down below, George Weil uh, was directed from the balcony by Fermi where he wanted the poison rods positioned as he slowly moved them, had them removed. So he would ask, uh, he would call down to George and uh, say, pull the rod out to a foot. Then he'd wait a while to see how the neutron level built up. The level of neutrons would go up and then it would level off at some point. Okay, well now, it wasn't self-sustaining because every time we did that with more fuel, the level where it leveled off would become higher. And that went on for quite some time, and that, uh, in fact, all morning. Yeah, and then that mechanical counter kept going faster and faster and faster as they pulled out the control rod. Finally, they had to switch over to a, a, a cylindrical recorder at that time. Uh, it had soot and a needle on it, and you could see the activity going up. Fermi, I guess, was actually plotting the reciprocal, and he could tell when it crossed the abscissa, the thing was going to go critical. The counting kept, rate kept going up and up, and then finally, just before lunch, he said, okay, uh, George, let's go to lunch, which, which sort of amazed everybody. You, you would have thought he would continue through lunch, and so we all... Wow, put the control rod all the way back in. We closed up, went over to the commons, which is where we always ate lunch together. Came back after lunch, had George pull out the control rod to where it had been. It wasn't much longer, he pulled out a couple of more centimeters, and I was very antsy, because boy, this, that counter was just going, it, it just clogged, it wouldn't count that fast. Finally, Fermi, to most everybody's relief, I guess you'd say, said, okay, zip in. I don't know where that term ever came. And George put the uh, control rod all the way back in, and everybody cheered. The whole gallery was filled with people. I guess it was Wigner brought out a bottle of Chianti, and everybody had a little sip. I just went back to work. I was doing some work down the hall. I had a little lab down there. Well, first there was clapping from the balcony where Fermi was, which signified that it was going to go critical. And we were called over to shut down the pile, and we joined the whole group. And uh, at that time, uh, Wigner presented Fermi with that bottle of uh, the wine. Wigner had been uh, hiding this bottle of wine, and uh, he presented it to Fermi. He had bought it, oh, three months before, because he was so sure that uh, Fermi would succeed. And uh, Fermi sent somebody out for little tiny paper cups, and all of us there were given a little bit of wine, and we toasted Fermi. After we had the little toast that Fermi poured for us, that was done in silence. 
And nobody said anything, which I thought was a fairly remarkable thing. There was no uh, big hullabaloo of, uh, of doing something that was truly momentous, given what had, t had taken place there and the implications of what might follow. There were two things that might follow, nuclear power for civilian purposes, or what was really the purpose at that time was a nuclear weapon. And this made it virtually certain. In, in any case, this was a truly momentous occasion, and it was quiet. Uh, and all I've been able to uh, kind of come up with, it was because everybody knew that it was momentous. And what's there to say? Except we've done it. Now we know we can do it. We can do what we're supposed to do.